Okay, thank you for joining. So let's start the panel about the Middle East. Right, so we have big news the, the last few days. But today, the main topics about social transformations, but maybe Nakagasan may touch upon a little bit about the so, uh, political issues, but main discussion about social changes. And uh, before starting, uh, may I ask you the quick question? Right? People, have you ever been to Saudi Arabia before? We have uh, Faisal and Sarah from Saudi Arabia. So could you raise your hand? Have you ever been to Saudi Arabia? Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven people have been to Saudi Arabia out of uh, 20, 30 people. Maybe 20% uh, of people are already in Saudi Arabia. So Maha, I should ask Lebanon as well. So have you, could you raise your hand with people who ever been to the Lebanon before? Oh, two people. Two out of the 30, so maybe 5% uh, uh, of the people have been to uh, Saudi, uh, Lebanon before. So this is a reality between G1 Global and the Middle East. So maybe next year, the more people raise hand, and uh, we like to connect more with the Middle East today. Okay, uh, I'm currently working in Globus Europe, established last year, and I'm covering the Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And I'm working with the Saudi Telecom company, STC, uh, the panelist, uh, 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 Sarah's company. And then I visited the Riyadh last year uh, after many years from my last visit. Actually, I was shocked, you know. That was a totally different country which I had known. Totally different city, totally different atmosphere. So I would like to Sarah and uh, maybe Faisal to share what is going on in Saudi Arabia. Maybe people hear the image of Saudi Arabia totally different from the current situations. So that is one thing which I'd like to do today. And secondly, uh, I would like to discuss about how uh, global uh, society can contribute to the transformation in Middle East, vice versa, how Middle East can contribute to a global society, uh, you know, the, the, uh, con the in, the compor in, in cooperation, right? So this is the purpose of this uh, panel today. So there are two, three key discussions. One is what is going on, the current transformations, and what is the success behind? That is one thing. Secondly, I would like to ask the panelists, what are the challenges in the region, and how to overcome that challenge, and capitalize from that change to uh, the, uh, the, the development of the country. And thirdly, let's discuss about the future of the country, of the region. So these three are the key discussions of the panel. So first discussions, I would like to ask the uh, current uh, situations of the changes and what is behind. So Faisal, Faisal uh, you are from the media, Arab News. Would you share your overview of the current transformations and what is behind the mechanism or the, the interconnections of the different factors for success? Would you share the overview at the beginning, please? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your question. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't be there uh, this year uh, in person. And just to kind of build on your introduction about what's happening uh, in Gaza, I think what's happening in Gaza uh, proves, uh, if anything, that what is important, uh, how uh, economic transformation, uh, how giving people hope uh, is important, uh, when you have a, a, a place in the world where 2.2 million people are living um, uh, in dire conditions, 50% uh, under the poverty line, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure we will get to talk to it. But uh, the point here is um, economic uh, transformation, uh, prosperity, uh, sustainability is uh, important to avoid these kind of uh, situations. Now, um, on a more positive uh, note for sure, uh, what has been happening in uh, Saudi Arabia, and I remember the first G1 conference I attended about five or six years ago, uh, there was an oil price uh, crisis. Uh, we had still not embarked on the Vision 2030 program, which primarily uh, seeks to diversify Saudi economy away from oil. Well, here we are uh, six years later or seven years uh, later, 
uh, with being the fastest growing G20 uh, uh, economy, um, we have been able to surpass a lot of uh, or many uh, of the targets of Vision 2030, including, for example, women inclusion uh, in the workforce, which was set for 30% by 2030. Uh, last year, I'm proud to say we surpassed the target. We are at 36%. Uh, uh, we've surpassed the target for tourists despite uh, the pandemic. The new target is 150 million visitors a year for a country that didn't really have a tourism uh, economy uh, only a few, a few years ago. Uh, according to Ipsos, we are the second happiest um, citizens uh, in uh, the world, uh, which is all uh, remarkable. The main question is, now we are seeing these uh, results, the main question is, how did we uh, get there? How did we get there is a very important uh, question, and people only have to remember how critical, how cynical uh, some of the skeptics were in the past few years. Uh, but I suppose if you are the captain of the ship, in this case, it's the crown prince, um, you cannot stop the ship and steer the direction in the other way every time one of the sailors uh, is complaining. You set your sail, you go full throttle, uh, you have to navigate according to the wind speed, according to the waves. Uh, sometimes you stop, sometimes you go forward, but you just don't change direction. Everybody, anytime somebody has a different point uh, uh, of uh, view. Um, what has been also very helpful is the uh, help of some of our um, friends who have believed in the program, invested in the program, supported the uh, program. Um, our uh, insistence on the diversification uh, of the pool of partners that can um, uh, help, particularly with some of our most reliable partners who are still our friends and partners, but uh, on some cases, particularly in the security matters, there has been some uh, shortfalls. Uh, but again, you don't stop there. You look for the alternatives. Uh, you try to make the most of the uh, situation uh, and uh, move uh, forward. Um, we're glad to see, uh, the last point I want to say is we're glad to see that Japan has been instrumental. And in fact, uh, some people might not know this, but when the vision was imagined, Japan was one of the few countries in the world that were looked at as a role model. Why do I say this? Um, so Japan, as you know, is a country that is very much proud of its past. It's very much proud of its tradition. Yet it managed to embrace modernity, embrace technology, be a pioneer uh, in technology without allowing modernity to really ruin or corrupt the spirits or the culture or the traditions of uh, the Japanese. Um, this is a very good model for us in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, because as you know, we are also very much proud of our past, very much proud of our traditions, very much proud of our uh, culture. Uh, we want to be, and we are now being, one of the world leaders in many technological uh, aspects in modernity, but we don't want to let go of our uh, heritage, history, heritage, and, and culture. So Japan is a very important uh, country and is a very good friend of uh, Saudi Arabia. And uh, as you know, um, in 2019, Arab News launched Arab News uh, Japan, uh, so arabnews.jp, which is the first ever uh, Arab media uh, in Japanese language. Uh, um, and it has been a tremendous uh, success since then because of the importance of the relationship between Japan and the Middle East. Uh, may I remind uh, the audience um, that 85% of Japan's energy comes from the Middle East, around 50 or 60% comes from Saudi Arabia. Uh, thank, so you, thank you very much for giving us energy. Our security, our security is your security. Thank you so much. Maybe uh, Koichi will touch upon the Japanese uh, point of view later. But uh, let me ask a quick question, uh, uh, Faisal. I, I do understand the leadership by the, the Crown Princess, for sure. But how people follow the prince this time, you know, very seriously. And what is the reason why, why this happened? This, ha this may happen in the past, but this time really I feel the seriousness of the people. Why this happens? Would you explain a little bit about that? 
course. So uh, yes, it is the leadership, but also part of the leadership is choosing your time wisely. Uh, when I get asked about the vision and the transformation that's happening and the reforms, I mean, you need to be a Saudi expert or have been following the uh, uh, you know social reforms in Saudi Arabia to understand the significance of them. Um, and these are groundbreaking reforms when we look at what has happened with religious reform, what has happened with uh, women's rights. So part of the leadership is also choosing the right moment and the right time to do this. Um, we couldn't have done this 20 years ago. You asked me about the people. The people is uh, a majority of the population is now the youth. Around 70% is less than 30 years old. The Crown Prince himself, His Royal Highness, is 38 years old. Um, so, uh, in fact, the timing couldn't be better uh, for a population that has, unlike me, for example, I grew up in an era where I'm actually in between, as a child of the 80s, in between the era of digital, in between the era of satellite television, and I actually, uh, for those millennials in the audience I who might not know, they were actually black and white television, so I actually captured that and I captured the new uh, technology. But uh, so what I'm trying to say here is for a huge majority of the population, a lot of the things didn't make sense. It just didn't make sense for a population that is 70 percent under 30, why women could not uh, drive. Um, it could, didn't make sense why we were tolerating uh, some of the religious extremist views uh, when a lot of people are very international minded, um, very open minded very well uh, traveled, uh, very tolerant, uh, why we were um, uh, coexisting with these extremist views which have now been uh, eliminated. So choosing the time is very uh, careful. We wouldn't have done this, uh, we hadn't have been able to do this 20 or 30 uh, years ago, um, but a major contributor, contributor to the success of the vision and the leadership is the consensus of the majority of the population who are 70% um, uh, under 30. And let us not forget, it is also a big bonus. The last point is it's a big bonus when you include 50% of the population, uh, which are women, which had no say, uh, no jobs, and almost no rights before the vision. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So it's now right time, right person, right time. Okay. Uh, before Koichi, let me ask Sarah. Uh, she's in the uh, middle of the, uh, the transformations, and she's my partner for the business, and she's from STC, Service Telecommunication Company, and she's in charge for corporate education leader in the company. So Sarah, would you add something to uh, the Faisal points, and from the corporate uh, education standpoint, how would you share your thoughts about the leadership or leader development in, term, in terms of the transformation in Saudi Arabia? Would you share your thoughts on that, please? Uh, well, sure, uh, Torsan. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me uh, here today. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, allow me to share my views from a uh, corporate education perspective. The recent transformation, uh, in my view, uh, are attributed to three key factors. One of them, as my colleague Faisal had mentioned, the technological advancement. This rapid advancement in technology drives this transformation in the region. And today we see organizations are investing in upskilling their workforce so they can meet the demand of this uh, digital era. Uh, also focusing on knowledge economy instead of oil-based economy, where governments start focusing more on uh, building the, the base in terms of talent, in terms of leadership, in terms of the needed skill set and mindsets and behavior to drive this economical growth, uh, the tech economical growth. Uh, last but not least is the drive for innovation and entrepreneurship, where there is a growing demand for uh, and emphasis for innovation, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, flourishing the startup and SME environment. Uh, where new businesses businesses could uh, drive uh, the potential future economy of the region. So uh, speaking from the experience here, uh, leaders' development plays a very crucial role when it comes uh, to this transformation. Leaders are the drive force when it comes uh, behind the, the, those changes. They set the vision, they set the direction, they make important decisions, and they inspire their teams to follow and believe in that vision. 
So the effective development ensures that re leaders are equipped with the necessary skills, uh, the necessary mindsets, the necessary behaviors to drive those transformation. And uh, in my view, investing in leadership development is one of the most valuable commitments any organization can do uh, to meet the demand of the future. Okay, thank you very much. Sarah, I will ask you more things afterwards, but thank you very much for sharing your thoughts at the beginning. So Koi-san, thank you for waiting. Uh, the priest, uh, he was ex-diplomat in the region, and he's currently researcher for the region. So we just share about the Japan perspectives on the Middle East, and maybe Kishida Prime Minister visited recently. So would you uh, share some implications of his visit for the region, please? Oh, Takasan, thank you very much. And uh, firstly, you know, it's my great pleasure to be here uh, with you. And uh, I heard uh, today, you know, it is the first time to deal with the Middle East issues in front. Almost first time. Almost first time, right? For the f first time in 2011. And uh, I think it's really uh, timely and uh, courageous decision to pick up today because, uh, you know, Gaza's issues uh, should be uh, discussed. Even, you know, today's uh, discussion will be a major topic, uh, as you said, in society. But uh, it's inevitable, you know, uh, to talk, talk with politics, economics, and society uh, at the same time. L let me introduce myself, though, you know, uh, G1 Global staff didn't allow to introduce myself, but because of uh, the fundamental discussion, because I studied Arabic uh, in Egypt, uh, I joined to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1994. This is exactly uh, after one year Oslo Agreement, you know, uh, Palestinians, uh, Israelis, at that time, uh, American uh, President uh, Bill Clinton uh, mediated between uh, Israelis uh, Shimon uh, Isaac Rabin and uh, Chairman Yasser Arafat. I, I, after that, I was a first former diplomat working, working in Gaza. At that time, a Japanese representative office opened in Gaza because you know, Hamas did not occupy yet. From 2007, Hamas occupied. So Gaza was free. Uh, I was living in Tel Aviv and uh, every day, as a diplomat from uh, commute from Tel Aviv to Gaza. So I was so shocked that this time, you know, uh, Hamas, Palestinians, you know, admitted to the Israelis' uh, your lines. It, it, it was unimaginable at that time. So point is that at that time, Chairman Arafat, yes, Arafat, I, ha I had a lot of times to interpret uh, to him. Uh, his dream was to establish Palestinian independent state and uh, get, uh, you know, should be the Palestinian capital, should be Jerusalem. And uh, he, you know, Palestinian should get the right of refugee, you know, to, to back to back to hometown. Unfortunately, and uh, he passed away in 2004, then uh, negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians suspended since 2014. So question is that, especially to Faisal, why, you know, uh, recently, why this, you know, things happened because of the, uh, I think firstly Biden's administration is really in a hurry to, to get the uh, legacy toward the uh, next uh, election in United States. So in order to get the uh, legacy between Israel and uh, Saudi Arabia. And secondly, I was so shocked that uh, MBS, uh, you know, made an interview to Fox and uh, he is, you know, he made a very, you know, positive comments on the normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia. I'm really af afraid now Arab people already forgot the uh, Palestinian issues, Palestinian people. I think this Hamas's message, not just to Israel, but also to Arab people for all. So this is also because before, you know, and the happening, you know, two days ago, I, s I thought we talked to Takas and the tema is, you know, social issues and drive, economic drive. But now we have to be back again politics uh, in the Middle East. So that's why today uh, I should raise up this issue. And for Japan, as you said, uh, Faisal and you know, 85% uh, uh, we, you know, the Japan is dependent on the uh, oil to the Middle East. But now, after the uh, Russians invasion to Ukraine, uh, uh, oil, oil dependence on the Middle East has exceeded um, more than 79 uh, or 78, almost 100%, uh, sorry, uh, 97 and 98, almost 100%, very, very, you know, up. That's why for Japan, it's very important to get, again, stability of the Middle East. This is our national interest. 
And thank you very much for appreciation toward the uh, Japan and Saudi Arabia's good relations. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Faisal, do you have any quick comment in uh, 30 seconds about that? Please unmute. Uh, sure. Uh, um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yes, uh, it's actually very important. You are right. Uh, we were uh, at the brink of actually a breakthrough in uh, normalization uh, between Saudi Arabia uh, and Israel, uh, particularly, as you rightly mentioned, the Biden administration was uh, in a hurry to make this happen possibly for its own uh, own agenda. Uh, it's, uh, as you said, a legacy. It's a winning ticket for the next uh, election. Um, just let me just point out something that is very important. The Saudi position has been clear for 20 years now. So if you remember in the Arab Peace Initiative that was announced in the Arab League in 2002 in Beirut, um, the Saudi hand has been extended to uh, Israel since uh, then on the, on the condition of the recognition of the Palestinian state, um, the 67 borders, which has always been a starting point of the negotiations. Uh, of course, the recent escalation that has happened now is going to complicate uh, things. But as you know, as somebody who has been following the, the, the um, issue since uh, Oslo, peace is never going to be uh, easy. There's always going to be ups uh, and, uh, and downs. However, the 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 interesting or the the beauty uh, of uh, the position here, the Saudi position, is it has been consistent. So uh, what you know, this doesn't change as it hasn't changed in the past twenty years. That the first condition for the normalization and all the leverage that Saudi Arabia brings in the Arab and Muslim world is Palestinian uh, rights. And the uh, most important thing is um, once you acknowledge these rights, as I said in the beginning, and then um, we have some sort of uh, an economic development plan for the Palestinian states, that's the only safeguard or the guarantee that what we saw two days ago doesn't happen again. Okay, thank you very much, Faisal. And Maha, thank you for waiting. Uh, let's get you back to the uh, topics into uh, the transformation of society. Uh, you are looking after the old Middle East, and we just share your comparisons between the countries. We are uh, focusing on Saudi Arabia, but you may have some ideas on other countries in the in the region. Would you share some of your thoughts on that? Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me on this panel. Um, before I share my thoughts about the comparisons, I want to make a small comment on the conflict in Gaza. I mean, let's just remember that this conflict did not start on October 7, 2023. We need to go back to 1948. That's one. Two um, developments over the past year and a half uh, have been such where uh, Palestinians are being killed with total impunity by both uh, settlers, but also by, I mean, there is a, an apartheid system in place in Israel today that treats different citizens in a very different way. Violence begets more violence. And the bottom line is without a sustainable peace, without a recognition, a rights-based framework, a recognition of, for the rights of the Palestinians, this entire region will not see peace. It's not just uh, 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 between Palestinians and Israelis. The tragedy over the past few days would have been, could have been avoided had there been a sustainable peace in place. And I concur with Faisal, the 2002 peace plan initiative that was launched in Beirut by the Arab League was very much based on the idea of land for peace. That peace plan, unfortunately, is no longer viable in part because there has been some bilateral arrangements without the land for peace formula, but also in part because much of the West Bank today is simply, I mean, th th there is no viable territory on which a Palestinian state could exist. The notion of a two-state solution, there's no territorial integrity. If you look at the map of the West Bank today, it is a criss it's a Swiss cheese. It's a crisscross of settlements and roads that Palestinians do not have access to. They are literally treated as second and third uh, rate citizens. So I think we need to put the, the, the conflict in context if we want to really look at what would make a for a sustainable peace in this region. 
This is one. Two, and I think this brings me to the broader question, which is what are the main opportunities, but also obstacles to uh, the transformation that's happening in the region? Conflict, perhaps, is one of the main obstacles. Not perhaps, actually. It is one of the main obstacles. Today, we have a region that is moving at two different speeds. You've got the Gulf countries that are uh, have reaped the benefit of uh, the increase in oil prices. They have considerable fiscal space, many of them, and are investing. I think the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, the Vision 2030, is perhaps the most emblematic of this kind of investment in uh, economic transformation at home. Uh, Sarah and Faisal have both talked extensively about uh, what this means in terms of female participation, uh, etc. Uh, I mean, there are there are direct links today. I think there was a study that came out uh, few, uh, recently that showed that female participation in the labor force has a direct impact on economic growth. And the Saudi Arabia's GDP is estimated to grow by, uh, I think, 3 or 3.5 percent over the next uh, few years. Uh, because of the increase in uh, female labor force participation. These are all very positives. Uh, Sarah talked about the educational programs to move people forward, uh, to move into the, I mean, to, to actually meet up with, a tech, with an economy, global economy that's transforming rapidly. Uh, we still haven't even begun to scratch the surface of what the advent of AI means for labor markets globally, let alone in this region where education levels are not on a par. But once you move out of the, uh, uh, I would say, Gulf countries, particularly Saudi Arabia, then you'd have a different story unfolding. Um, you've got uh, countries in the region where there is conflict and devastation, like Syria, like Lebanon, like, uh, like uh, Libya. Uh, you've got countries that are in crisis, like uh, Lebanon, Egypt. Egypt, there's a lot of concern around Egypt today and what, what may develop after the elections. It's a country that could possibly go become insolvent at some point. Um, there's a lot of discontent that is developing. There, there are real genuine concerns around what could develop in Egypt, uh, Tunisia. I mean, the, the story is very different from one place to the other. Um, I think in terms of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, maybe the most significant uh, message is that um, economic transformation on its own is not enough. Investments in economic growth are not enough in and of themselves. There has to be an investment, a genuine investment. When you look, and I'll just give another example, when you look at labor, for, uh, sorry, educational outcomes, the ratio of female to males in a number of Arab countries is actually larger. You'll find more females, um, uh, I mean, I'll just give a number of examples. Uh, that you'll have more females uh, participating in, in the labor force than, uh, than males across different countries in the region. In Algeria, it's, uh, the ratio is 1.46. In Iraq, well, Iraq, it's a little less. In, uh, uh, in Jordan, in Palestine, in Tunisia. So, but we are not capitalizing on, this, on, this, on, the, on these educational outcomes. There are other hindrances to this. But for me, the bottom line is without an investment in an infrastructure of peace and genuine stabilization, political stabilization, that's built on a just and sustainable peace, economic growth is simply not enough. Mm -hmm. And as we, we've seen over the past few days, um, one, re one part of the region will go in one direction, the other part is, is, is falling back considerably, uh, but it, 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 it continues to, it will continue to hinder growth across countries in the region. All right. Thank you very much, Maha. Maybe we already uh, get into the second discussions about the challenges uh, the facing in the uh, Middle East. Maybe I can ask Salar, you are in the middle of the transformations and you are the female leader in the company. And uh, can you imagine, uh, audience here, that I visited Saudi Arabia and I visit STC Academy. And maybe s my impression, 70% of my counterparts are female leaders or staffs already. And Sarah is general manager and her boss, Moody, director, she's also a female leader. So I feel that already uh, things happen in the region. But Sarah, uh, would you share about your thoughts or your experiences, how 
uh, urban leaders will take a role of the transformations and how that impact will, you know, the big or 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 it's going on in the future. W would you share your thoughts about that? Yeah, sure, uh, definitely, uh, Tarasan. Uh, if I may uh, first answer the first part of your questions about the uh, challenges. So from my perspective, some of the current challenges is the scale gap. So as we move forward uh, more into the digital and knowledge-based economy, there are increased demand for new skill sets and mindsets. The challenge lies in equipping the workforce quickly with these uh, mindsets and skill sets to be more uh, able to contribute in an accelerated manner to the country economy globally. And going to the second part, um, as a female leader, I believe women can uh, play a very crucial role in the transformation process because women can bring a unique perspective and skills to the table. And uh, there are an increased participation currently in the region uh, for women in a leadership role which bring more diverse perspectives to the table, more innovative thinking, and more inclusive decision making. And by the way, the research has shown that uh, gender diverse leadership teams are more effective, innovative, and uh, have more effective decision making. Um, so that is my view of the situation. Maybe as I, I have mentioned before in another uh, panel, that now it's becoming the norm in the region. If this question was asked maybe 10 years ago, um, the views would be different. But now in Saudi Arabia, it's, it's just the norm. Mm -hmm. So if that is the case, what would be the next challenge for you to take as a reader of the STC in terms of the corporate training? How can I uh, describe that challenges which you like to take in the coming years? Well, I believe uh, all of us as Saudis in the region, our challenge is one challenge, which is executing this vision 2030, the very ambitious vision where every young male and female in the region are very eager and passionate to see the result and to beat the timeline of 2030 and achieve ahead of time. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we spent a lot of time for our current situation, so I'd like to discuss about the future. Uh, Faisal, uh, could you share your insights of Vision 2030 and ambitions outlined by your Muhammad, Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia? How, does, how do these plans leverage further challenges, changes, and how will they create the future landscape of the region? How would you explain like this about that? Well, I think we're already looking at Vision 2040 now. Uh, a lot of the targets of Vision 2030 have been uh, achieved. It's a very clear path uh, where uh, we're headed. And uh, I would like to talk a little bit about the opportunity uh, that exists for uh, other countries, for other companies, for many industries uh, around the world. Um, if you look at everything from mining, for example, where there's a huge project to uh, un, uh, to, to, to tap into the uh, untapped resources of, of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has been known uh, almost exclusively for, for oil. But if you sit with His Excellency, the Minister of Industry and Mining, uh, they will tell you we haven't even scratched the surface of what other resources uh, we have available. One interesting topic that is now uh, being uh, discussed, as you know, in the media and uh, perhaps it has been uh, alluded to uh, during the recent discussions about uh, the Saudi-Israeli-US-Palestinian deal um, is the Saudi nuclear capabilities. Um, I can tell you there has been enough uranium that has been discovered in Saudi Arabia to power Saudi Arabia indefinitely with clean uh, energy. Um, there are talks with the Americans who were the first uh, and the priority partner uh, to create the equivalent of Aramco. So an Aramco of Saudi, uh, so a Saudi American cooperation to create the Aramco of nuclear energy. Of course, this also uh, um, protects or safeguards against any concerns about the use of the program, which has always been intended and always going to be peaceful. Um, but you can imagine the size of the uh, opportunity. Uh, when we look at even more lighter topics, such as sports and uh, entertainment, 
uh, as it stands today, we have some of the uh, most important uh, football players uh, around the world playing in the Saudi Football League. Yeah. Within a span of a few months, uh, Saudi football uh, is now being watched religiously across television channels all across uh, the globe. Uh, we've just submitted the uh, announced the intention to submit the bid for hosting the World Cup in 2034. And it looks like it, we are going to be uh, the winner. It also looks like we're going to be the winning um, bid for Expo 2030, uh, which the results come out uh, in uh, November. Uh, and this is all the result of the focus, determination, and hard work that has been put into place over the past five or six years. But I have to reiterate why this is important for everybody. Um, we've alluded to this twice now during the panel, but our security is your security. And thank you for the update on the numbers. Um, you know, my, my uh, estimate was at around 85%. Um, it makes sense that after the war in Ukraine, Japan's dependency on oil from the region has uh, increased. Um, this is also not just a security uh, risk, but also there's a lot of business opportunities when we think that we are building a uh, 500 billion with a B dollar uh, city uh, in Neom called uh, The Line, when you have all of these giga projects, um, think of all the opportunities that are uh, there for uh, subject matter experts, uh, for skilled uh, labor, for uh, companies that want to form uh, joint uh, ventures. And what it means for um, the Japanese economy, for the global economy to have a stable Middle East, because uh, an integral part of Vision 2030 is we cannot succeed alone. This is why this has been paired for the past two or three years. You would have seen uh, almost a U-turn or a reversal uh, in Saudi uh, foreign policy to uh, resolve uh, pending uh, issues uh, or conflicts in the region as much as we can, of course, because it takes two to tango. But the idea is uh, you know, a rising tide lifts uh, all boats, and nobody can succeed alone. We all have to succeed together. Thank you very much. Koi-san, do you have any quick comments against uh, Faisal's uh, about the future of Saudi Arabia? Yes. From investors' view of Japan world. Right. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, separate from politics, I'm also at the same time now I'm business consultant uh, for Mitsubishi Research Institute. I had already uh, five times uh, to business trip to Riyadh. And I'll be in India at the end of this month also. I know the, you know, uh, as far as I said, vision not now 2030, maybe 2040, but uh, I heard, I, you know, I know that the uh, three pillars of 2030 is uh, you have one is a uh, vibrant uh, society, and second one, thriving economy, and third one is ambitious nation. I, I free, you know, uh, free, uh, free whenever I come to Riyadh and I visit to the uh, Ministry uh, Investment, I'm sorry, not the STC, but uh, uh, Commerce, Health. Yes, as the Stolzan said, that uh, more than half of uh, staffs are female and uh, they are, you know, working very hard and they have a lot of pressure from MBS, especially to Director General Rebel. If, you know, once they cannot get the, you know, goals, maybe, you know, they'll be. Uh, for uh, another post. And uh, again, you know, this is, uh, I really feel uh, the, uh, uh, your, the kingdom's, uh, you know, uh, growth. But at the same time, I'm, I really would like to point out that uh, Mahasan's point, the future of the Middle East. Yes, I, I'll be in, I, am, I was in the ad, I'll be in the ad. Now I'm concentrated on the, uh, the kingdom. I was not, I'm not working now in the Palestine. But uh, again, I'm uh, really afraid that the future of the Middle East will be divided between, uh, you know, like the kingdom, you know, much more, uh, much richer country, or like Palestinian, I don't know, Lebanon, but uh, Algeria, uh, as Arabia, Afghanistan, maybe, uh, you know, much poorer countries. I, I, it's really, you know, the, the uh, you know, the point which should be discussed. Okay. Thank how you. How the region will you know, go up all together or to collaborate or to support each other. That's the point. Right. I see. Thank you very much. Uh, Sara, I, I think you are working with many different universities or institutions all over the world, and you have some discussions for collaborations or investment. Would you suggest to the investors here 
uh, how is the good collaborators for Saudi Arabia, for SCC? Any suggestions or uh, advice to us from your experiences with uh, international collaborations? Yeah, so uh, we are very open for, for the world. We welcome uh, any investor and any uh, cooperation or organization to come and work on our land. Uh, if I may give just a couple of advices to ease the collaboration, uh, I would first advise to build relationships. Building a strong relationships with local partners can open doors and facilitate smoother collaborations and opportunities. Uh, second is understanding the local context. Uh, because each region has its unique uh, social cultural context, understanding this context is very crucial to develop effective collaboration strategies. Uh, third advice would be uh, align with Vision 2030, Saudi Arabia Vision 2030. We have speak a lot about it today. Outlines the country strategic direction. Aligning your opportunities with uh, or your business plans with our vision could help in identifying pro promising promising collaborations. Um, last but not least, and I might be again biased here, focusing on skill development. There is a very, very strong focus in the, in the region on education and skills, uh, development, upskilling uh, uh, to meet our ambition plan. Collaboration in these areas uh, will definitely uh, bring a significant impact for both ends. I see. Thank you very much, Salah. May I ask one more thing, Salah? I, I hope you will answer. I think you will uh, work with different countries. American universities or the university from Europe, university from Japan, including Globis. Which country do you have the most good experience in terms of the collaborations? If you can say something about that. There are some different nationalities here. Please be careful, yes. but please try to say something <laughs> about your preferences or your good experiences. Well, um, there is no certain preference, honestly, Tarasan, uh, because we are focusing currently in Saudi Arabia and in SEC to build more of a global mindset and global perspective. Mm -hmm. We love to deal with, with the whole, the east side and west side, with the, with the Europeans and uh, all around the globe. Our, we are mandated to build a global mindset. So to get the best from around the globe, Different experiences uh, when we deal definitely with uh, US-based universities from Japan based, from China based, from European based. But all of them are bringing different perspective and different uh, interesting angle of, of, uh, of the topic that we choose to uh, deal with. I see. Thank you very much. Very diplomatic reply. But I <laughs> observed in Saudi Arabia, they are really collaborate with many different countries and they learn and each other. So that's amazing. So I think we, Japan, should learn from Saudi Arabia how to collaborate with the foreign investors or, or partners. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, before going to Q&A, uh, uh, Maha, would you wrap up a little bit the whole discussion up to here and open up Q&A? Uh, Maha, could, would you share your final thoughts a little bit in uh, one minute? <laughs> Sorry to ask okay. you in a very difficult way, but uh, please. Yeah, I mean, wrapping up what uh, the rich discussion is a bit difficult, I think. Uh, but what I would say, I think my main takeaway is there's obviously considerable investment happening in the kingdom uh, and this economic transformation, which is incredibly positive. But as a result, and there are various challenges in this region, uh, we didn't talk about how connected this region is in terms of uh, not only in terms of language and culture, but also in terms of planned infrastructure investments. We didn't talk about the, you know, this notion of connecting India uh, via uh, the UAE and Saudi Arabia to uh, Europe. We haven't talked about these massive uh, projects that are being put forward as a way of connecting the region. Um, events over the last uh, few days have shown that the region needs to is basically is interconnected. What happens in one part affects the other. The investments in uh, human mobility, in uh, education, in cooperation has to extend across the region so that one can lift all. We didn't also talk about the challenges within countries, and there are considerable challenges within countries. It's not just between countries. So I think there's a lot to be said. This is an ongoing conversation. 
uh, but I concur with what much of what my uh, colleagues Faisal and uh, Sarah have said on this panel. Okay, thank you very much. So let's open up for question from the the floors. So one or two people. Okay, Yangaki san and some others. Okay, let's go from them. Th thank you very much. Uh, I'm not a, a pro pro professional in, in this area, so I'm just still in a learning process. But uh, my question is about uh, the, the relation, the role Japan can play in this area. And I was a little bit surprised in April to see uh, that the, the foreign, foreign minister of Saudi Arabia and the foreign minister of Iran uh, met in Beijing and, and I w my question will be, wha what's the role or positioning uh, of China uh, in this context? And is there any more role that Japan can play? Uh, maybe to Nakagawa. <laughs> oh, well, uh, thank you for asking. And uh, now I'm not diplomat, so I can say freely, I think so. For Japan, it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, reconciliation between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran mediated by China, it, it's really bad case for Japan because as I said, Japan is now currently depending on the Middle East more than oil, more than uh, you know, 70, sorry, 97, age, almost 100%. But at the same time, China is also has a, the same interest for us. So if China's influence you know, on, uh, uh, on the Middle East, especially Gulf countries, uh, you know, before that, you know, United States, uh, the influence on the Middle East is very strong, but, but now is uh, gradually, you know, degrading. So if we have to co compete, you know, between Japan and China, so that, that's, uh, you know, uh, I think a very bad scenario for us. So we have to, you know, avoid us. So again, back to the uh, normalization between Israelis and Saudi Arabia. Now currently, United States, Biden's administration is trying to do that. But I, I suppose maybe China also, because this is this the reconciliation ma mediated by China. And uh, China uh, invited uh, Palestinian President Abbas uh, to Beijing. So maybe possible. So now we have to see uh, carefully about uh, China's political intention to do that. Maybe uh, the better question yeah, to- Maybe Faisal, uh, you want to talk a bit. Okay, please go ahead, Faisal. Thank you uh, so much for the question. Thank you so much for the question. It's a very important question. And I um, somewhat disagree uh, with uh, my honorable colleague there. Uh, I think this is one of the rare uh, coincidences or situations where the Chinese and the Japanese interests align. Um, not that China is doing this because it wants to benefit Japan, but you simply cannot separate the two. China currently is the largest importer of Saudi oil in the world. They import anything between 1.7 to 2 million barrels uh, a day using the same route uh, of export that comes to Japan. So in essence, um, uh, this any interruption of the flow of energy also affects uh, China. And as you know, uh, the Iranians, actually when I was in Japan, just before launching Arab News Japan in 2019, um, I was with uh, His Excellency Taro Kono, who was the Minister of Defense, and uh, we were also at the G1 uh, conference in September when an attack uh, on Saudi Aramco happened on the Ibgeg uh, oil refinery uh, in 2019, and there was a high status of alert uh, in, in Japan because, uh, because of that. Now, uh, so I am also very much aware of how the Chinese are perceived in Japan, how the Chinese are perceived in the United States, and in many parts of the world. Um, but you also have to look at it from our perspective, from the Middle Eastern perspective. Uh, China does not have the uh, luggage uh, or the negative perceptions that some of the Western colonial powers might have had in the past. I'm talking about countries like France and the United uh, Kingdom, or the recent wars waged by countries like the United States. Their interests in the region remain, uh, until this day, actually, uh, very much economical. They rarely interfere in the politics of, uh, of the region. So um, add to that what I said in the beginning about some of our partners 
um, letting us down. Uh, unlike, uh, so uh, like my honorable colleagues, I, I'm also not a politician, so I'm free to speak the way I want. I'm particularly talking about the United States. Um, as you know, the relationship with this administration had its ups and downs. Currently, it's at an up, but it started off on the very wrong foot. Um, you know, uh, the president from the get-go during his campaign uh, election said that he wants to make Saudi Arabia a pariah, um, reversed the Trump era um, decision to list the Houthis, the Houthis as a terrorist group, when we shouldn't have uh, a debate on what consists a terrorist. At the end of the day, um, anybody who attacks civilians, civilian airports or refineries, use civilians for political or military means, should be classified as a terrorist. Add to that the withdrawal of the Patriot missile batteries from Saudi Arabia at a time when our cities were being uh, attacked. Um, that, you know, uh, forced us to rethink our defense strategy. Luckily, countries like uh, Greece, we managed to agree to borrow their Patriot missiles. We we're looking to diversify our military equipment purchases, but also it accelerated the need to try to resolve this problem once and for all, because for all the successes that I've mentioned, all, you know, being the fastest growing G20 economy, having Cristiano Ronaldo play in, in, in Saudi Arabia, uh, all the arts and the entertainment that it's happening, all of this will go away if there's no security uh, in the region. And if you cannot win by war, you have to try to win by peace. Um, the Chinese offered uh, a peace uh, to medi mediate a peace deal between uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran uh, in December when President Xi visited um, Riyadh. By March 10th this year, uh, the deal has been uh, signed. Um, the you know apart from the Chinese uh, interest uh, in doing this, as in um, a lot of the turmoil in the region is happening because of Iran. But effectively, uh, one of the ways they were convinced that if we solve this issue and Iran becomes a more reasonable player, this opens up Syria, Iraq, Yemen, uh, Lebanon to Chinese products. The other thing why this is important um, is, um, and I want to here to re-emphasize um, that Japan also tried to mediate between uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Some people might not remember that, but um, uh, the late Prime Minister uh, uh, Abe personally tried to mediate. The difference here is China actually has a lot of leverage over uh, Iran. Uh, Japan doesn't. So the Chinese have pledged around 300 to 400 billion with a B dollars of investment in Iran over the next 25 years. And as you know, uh, Iran really doesn't have much friends in the world. Currently, they have the Russians who have their hands full and um, Faisal, uh, China. Faisal, thank you very much for your uh, very nice stories. And I really learned, but uh, still we only have uh, five minutes. And sure. uh, maybe Maha want to touch up on a little bit about this. Now uh, we are discussing about political issues rather than social changes, but that is a reality of the Middle East. But Maha, would you, sorry to interrupt you, Faisal, but would you, may I ask Maha to talk a little bit about this? And I want to have one more question. So Maha, would you make it in a one sec, uh, not one second, one minute? <laughs> sorry to Just ask. Just very you. briefly, very briefly, I'd yeah, like to please. say that before China came on the scene, there had already been mediation between Iran, between Saudi Arabia and Iran ongoing for two years. These were, or a year and a half. Initially, they began in talks in Baghdad, and then they were happening in Oman. The, the fundamental agreements had already happened in the this dialogues that were happening, uh, and, they, and that were mediated by uh, uh, the Omanis. And the, and the Sultanate of Oman. So in a sense, that China reaped the benefit of a year and a half or two years of ongoing behind the scenes diplomacy that was born in the region. And I think it's very important to emphasize the importance of regional initiatives, dialogues between, the re between different countries in the region happening within the region. Could Japan have played a bigger role? I believe yes. I believe Japan's economic uh, footprint far outweighs its own political footprint in this region. Uh, and it definitely can play a bigger role uh, on the political front 
in many different arenas. Uh, maybe it does not have the clout, that, the economic clout that China has when it comes to Iran, and I, I agree with Faisal completely, uh, but I think it can play other. It has a very good relationship with Iran, as well as met with most actors in the region, and therefore can play a much more uh, active role uh, to mediate. Thank you very much. So last one or two. Okay, one and one more. Okay, last one, please. Don't talk about politics, much. No, no politics. So actually, I'm going to switch the topic. I have to, to change the theme of the. I'll change the topic to science. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much for giving us insights about the leadership uh, changes in Saudi Arabia and the area. Uh, I'm Daniel Morara. I work at uh, Shizuoka, Shizuoka University, university in Japan, and I'm interested in the change in Saudi Arabia towards renewable energy and how are you? I know you are attracting talent into the country. But how do you see the partnership and collaboration with Japanese institutions in research, in bilateral programs, in win-win situations in terms of science? So no politics, <laughs> science, pure science is actually a common language, I think. Thank you very much. So anyone can answer to this question? Maha or Sarah? Sarah, please turn on the video. <laughs> Maybe. Maha, will you try to? I think so. Uh, in all honesty, I think so. I mean, I, I haven't really followed. Okay, so Faisal, uh, please try. The, the room, what I would say is the room for collaboration mm -hmm. is huge. Science and technology is an emerging, actually, it's, it's, there's a lot of investments happening in the kingdom, but also in the UAE and in other parts of the region in uh, STEM. Uh, I would also emphasize the importance of women in STEM, mm -hmm. uh, and we see this also in the kingdom. There's a lot more emphasis there. Uh, but particularly technology, and this is again where we can bring in China because there's a lot of collaboration happening and investment happening by Chinese firms in uh, the technology sector, biotechnology, uh, of, uh, cloud computing, all of this. Uh, and I think there's a big role for Japan here uh, in terms of these collaborations. Uh, can I comment? Yes. Uh, finally, uh, I'd like to you know, make my, you know, uh, our Mitsubishi Research Institute's appeal. Uh, uh, actually, last week, uh, you, 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 uh, there were a Science and Technology Forum, STS Forum in Kyoto. Uh, we, Mitsubishi Research Institute, uh, made a sign with, uh, in the kingdom. Maybe, uh, uh, Faisal, you know, the uh, King Abdulaziz City for Science and Technology, uh, you know, Kakust. We, we made a uh, sign ceremony, uh, Kakust. So, we are Mitsubishi research issues also, uh, you know, think tank. So I, I hope, you know, this uh, memorandum will be, you know, uh, stepped up to the, uh, uh, the, the higher level uh, for science between uh, Japan and the kingdom. S thank you, Tosu. Thank you very much. Why so some quick comment? Uh, well, part of the uh, part of the reform uh, program is also reforming the educational sector. And there are very uh, strict targets on a number of universities, including uh, the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, KAUST, King Saud uh, University, to advance in global positioning uh, and ranking with regards to research and uh, innovation. The, the other thing I would like to say also, a lot of the GIGA projects are experimenting with the unknown. Uh, so, um, and, you know, this is, has been announced, like we want to, to venture, we don't want to do something conventional. We are building a first of a kind city in Neom called uh, The Line. And essentially this is a huge experiment in enhancing um, human living uh, conditions, solving problems that pre-existed with cities. So this is all a green field for really the pioneers in technology, the pioneers in science. And who better than the Japanese uh, to be part? In fact, you know, this could be even uh, giving an edge to Japanese research centers and Japanese technology because, you know, these initiatives come funded and, you know, the idea is to find a solution. And you, you know you have to fund research and you have to uh, enable scientists and developers to come up with these uh, solutions. Uh, but to be there, you have to be there. Uh, the problem, not just with Japan, is a lot of the, and perhaps it's a problem at our end, we need to communicate uh, these opportunities better. Um, uh, the problem is, uh, it's really a, a, a market uh, or an opportunity uh, for the first, first movers. 
first movers are going to have a huge advantage. And my only advice would be for the Japanese uh, developers, for the Japanese researchers, companies, is to move quickly. All right. Thank you very much. So uh, let me wrap it up. Already time is up. My takeaway is I tried to talk about the social innovations or social changes, but uh, the almost discussion about the politics. And, uh, but I think that this is a destiny of the relationship with Middle East because uh, our impressions against Middle East is still about the politics or geopolitical issues. So we need to be, pre be prepared to remove or to understand well what is happening going on. That is one thing. And secondly, uh, uh, after that, more communications, more collaborations, more contacts as a human being or as a friend are needed. Because we are, are buying the oil 80% from Middle East and 60%, now 96%. And 60% out of 96 are from Saudi Arabia. But only eight people here been to Saudi Arabia. So maybe we need to start from the collaborations, more contacts and friendship. That's the starting point of the collaboration with Middle East. That's my takeaway today. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, big, give big hands to uh, all panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.